You are about to see some incredible photography. We'll put you eye to eye and in the nest with some of the most beautiful birds in the world. And they're right here in Georgia. But there is a twist to this story. It involves hats, herons, and heroes. We begin in a rookery, a place where birds gather to find a mate and raise their young. The almost deafening noise comes from adults looking for a partner and chicks begging for attention. Think of this as an apartment complex of sorts. There's the pregnant lady on branch 3A. The tri-colored heron picks at her nest like a mother-to-be preparing a nursery. She rolls her eggs around to keep membranes from sticking to the shell and distribute the heat. She settles down, but it doesn't feel quite right. She does this often as she waits patiently for her chicks. Upstairs, you have the newlyweds. This is wood stork love. That bill-to-bill -bill tap is like an engagement ring. They groom each other constantly, establishing a bond and letting other birds know this is their turf. In about 30 days, there will be eggs. Like any complex, there is the occasional property dispute. Despite the fact that there are plenty of trees, for some unknown reason, this spot is prime real estate for a nest. And what overworked mom doesn't recognize this scene? You walk in the door and everyone wants dinner. All the birds you see here are wading birds. Herons, egrets, wood storks, and ibis. Their long legs are designed to move quietly through the water. They depend on wetland areas for fish, and their eyes are positioned to focus straight down those long bills, which they use like a dagger. Watch what happens when this egret spots an insect. Biologist Brad Wynn has spent a lifetime studying these birds. It is more than a job. It is a mission. He believes the only way to protect them is to get us to understand their connection to these wetlands. So I just wanted to stop in here and show you some of the fish that these birds have been feeding on. Are you sure the alligators aren't going to get us? Um, no, but I'm bigger than you are, so you'd be the bait. Oh, thanks. This is the Butler Wildlife Refuge near Darien, which lies between Savannah and Jekyll Island. From afar, the refuge may look like a flat, muddy, overgrown piece of land. You have to get up close to see the diversity of life. So this is the richness of a wetland, and this is what the wetlands produce. And you can imagine with this, when this water dries down, and hundreds of thousands and millions of these fish concentrated in a pool, and you don't want to get bitten by this guy. These little diving beetles are uh, uh, quite nasty. Oh, good, good to know. Well, it rained last night. And what about this beetle? Does he bit. bite? Uh, no. Okay. okay. All right. Wow. Oh, yes, he does. He does. <laughs> I didn't know he bit. <laughs> really, he got you? Yay, biologist. <laughs> You get all that? Fortunately, Wynn knows his birds better than his bugs. With each scoop, Wynn brings up more insects, tiny shrimp, and a wide variety of fish. And we get that. And all wading birds are after the same thing, but each bird has a slightly different way of eating, especially the roseate spoonbill. As they're going back and forth, they can eat very tiny, minute shrimp and fish in the water. 
and that bill is like a couple of big spatulas and it's sifting through the water and they're very sensitive to touch and they will clap that bill shut very quickly when they feel something in there. That pink color comes from the crustaceans and algae they consume. Wood storks, the only storks commonly found in the U.S., eat mostly small fish like minnows. Their bills are so sensitive they don't need to see their prey. They grope through murky water and the bill snaps shut when it senses movement. Their featherless legs, it does two things. It lets them cruise through the water without picking up a lot of weight in their feathers that might be there. It also, if you think about the prey they're after, a minnow on the surface, the birds can move those legs gradually through the water without a lot of disturbance. But sometimes these birds create a disturbance on purpose. Notice how this wood stork shakes its feet in front to scare fish to the surface of the water. You may also notice the occasional alligator swimming by. Strange as it may seem, that's one of the reasons wading birds build their colonies over water. Alligators are like bouncers in a nightclub. They keep raccoons from climbing the trees. But if the water dries up and the alligators leave, raccoons will eat the eggs and kill the chicks. And they will work an entire colony tree by tree and kill um, young, take eggs, and essentially destroy over a period of you know, nights or weeks, destroy an entire colony of wading birds. I've seen entire trees, like a treetop like this, uh, will fly over it one week and come back you know, a few days later and you'll see some of the nests with dead chicks in them and then you come back a few days after that and the, everything in the nest has been destroyed by raccoons. They'll kill multiple uh, young and then just eat a little bit of what they've killed. Even with the alligators, many chicks will die. As egret chicks mature, they often kill each other. Researchers aren't sure why, but some studies indicate the first two chicks to hatch have almost twice the amount of testosterone as the third. You can see how aggressive they are with this adult as they beg for food. As they mature, it is common for them to turn on each other, and the weaker chick will be attacked and thrown from the nest. There is life and death here. Insects, alligators, songbirds, an entire ecosystem. Now, what once appeared to be a muddy field takes on new meaning. This is what people would call wasteland or have in the past before we really knew what was going on. This is, this is a nice uh, wetland area. You see the vegetation coming up in here uh, and it's flooded and life is just pumping out of this place. During breeding season, wading birds take their catch back to a treetop nest. It looks brutal, but the chicks grab at the adult bill to get food or stimulate regurgitation. Watch closely and you'll see some of the things Brad Wynn pulled up in his net all wrapped up in one fish ball. Wading birds will spend most of each day feeding their chicks. It is during this time of year in the spring when they are easier to spot. The snowy egret has feet that look like they were painted on. Nicknamed yellow slippers, the birds are noisy and aggressive. They would be comical if they weren't so beautiful. All wading birds are exquisite any time of year. But during mating season, these birds grow special breeding plumage, 
and transform into something magical. Just watch the dance. Colors change, even on their bills. Skin around the great egret eye turns bright green. The legs and bill of the white ibis become scarlet red. And this vivid blue on the tri-colored heron will only last a month or two. The feathers change too. Wood storks gain these fluffy collars. And the delicate display on the egrets grows right before the spring season, just in time to show off for the opposite sex. The plumage on egrets and herons is simply stunning. So much so, it almost led to their extinction. In the late 1800s, this is where most people saw these beautiful plumes. Women even wore whole birds on their heads. Audubon chief scientist Tom Bancroft says plume hunters would actually shoot birds off their nests, leaving the chicks to starve. They nest on colony areas, so there'll be a lot of them that will come into one area, sometimes as many as a thousand or more. And so they're coming back to that place day after day in order to build their nest, lay their eggs, find their mate, and so they're there. And so it's easy to find those colonies and then just come back on a regular basis. And over a merit period of days, you could kill most of them in a colony. In 1902, at just one auction house in London, 1,608 packages of heron plumes were sold. A package weighed about 30 ounces, and it took the feathers of four birds to make an ounce. So in that one sale, close to 200,000 egrets, or herons as they were called at that time, were killed for feathered hats. In Louisiana, conservationist E.A. McElhaney made a controversial film to expose the slaughters and shame the women. Though it is a silent film, you find that you brace yourself, waiting to hear the gunshot. McElhaney noted that the film was made under conditions as humane as possible. He wrote, real hunters often tear the egret with the skin and quivering flesh attached from the breast of the wounded but living bird. As that film was shown to members of Congress, women's clubs, and in rented theaters, the love affair with plumed hats began to sour. Meanwhile, in Boston, Harriet Hemingway was outraged when she read about the slaughters. She began holding tea parties, urging women to give up their hats and men to change the laws. The parties led to meetings and eventually gave birth to the Audubon Society. So Harriet Hemingway in Boston became really concerned about the status of birds and what was happening and brought together a number of women in Boston area to create the initial National Audubon Society, well, it's then the Massachusetts Audubon Society, and really created the movement that has been sustained to today. Laws were changed, and newly formed Audubon groups began to hire game wardens to protect the birds from hunters. In 1905, warden Guy Bradley was killed while trying to stop two poachers in South Florida. Today, few people would dream of wearing dead birds on a hat, but now there is a new threat, loss of habitat. Wading birds are dependent on forested wetlands for nesting, and much of that land is privately owned. 
We found such a place on the edge of Atlanta, where dozens of great blue herons built a rookery. They've been coming here for about five years, and each year their numbers have grown. Even so, because this is privately owned land, it could be filled and developed as residential property. But the owner of this land believes it's his responsibility to protect the birds. Months after nesting season, we met developer Ron Orr to discuss the future of the herons. It's incumbent on all of us to protect our environment. The birds are part of that environment. But in this case, particularly in this case, I mean, a couple of things. Uh, this uh, this uh, heron uh, nesting area, I haven't seen one this size uh, outside of the coast and coastal areas. This is just huge. But one of the reasons the herons are down here is because it's isolated. It has a wetland, but it's also close to the Chattahoochee River, Sweetwater Creek, so it has a great area for them to feed and nest on, and it's private. And that's one of the reasons why we've kind of kept this a secret is, is that we don't want a lot of people down here because the more people that come here, uh, they're very skittish. I mean, they will, they will go away in a heartbeat. Great blue herons are four feet tall with wings that can span six feet and a black plume that extends above their heads. Though called blue herons, they're really more of a grayish color. The males gather sticks for the females to build a platform-type nest. The survival of the chicks greatly depends on the ability of the parents to find food. They bring back fish, insects, frogs, or even mice. Great blue herons are opportunistic hunters and have been known to choke on fish too big for their necks. If the chicks make it through the first winter, they can live up to 15 years. They're special because they're on my property and I, I do feel responsible for them. It's not any more important to me than our overall environment. It's all important to me. The water, all of that is, is important. I mean, we're part of the environment. Though we tend to think of them as coastal birds, great blue herons breed across the United States. The danger for any rookery is human disturbance. Herons will not tolerate much interference or they will abandon their nests and leave the young. These are living on a 300-acre parcel of land close to Sweetwater Creek Park or has already taken steps to protect the rookery. As far as that section uh, of the property, uh, it will never be developed. Uh, we've, uh, there's about uh, 30 acres or more uh, that surrounds that, that uh, will never be. I mean, we're obligated, that's in the deed. We will never develop that. And we are not gonna allow anyone else to develop it. As a matter of fact, we're thinking about ways to fencing off some of the areas to actually keep people from from going down there, except for some viewing sheds, you know, where the park, uh, Sweetwater State Park, and uh, those folks can do some, some tours, you know, into the area. It's a very sensitive area during the nesting season. Orr says things are changing in his industry. In the past, developers have not always protected watersheds or wetlands. According to the EPA, over half of the nation's original wetlands have been drained or converted to other uses. Georgia lost about 22% of its forested wetlands between 1974 and 2005. Even so, that's far less than most states have lost, which may be why Georgia has become home to an increasing number of wading birds. And that's good for business. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service reports that one of every five Americans watches birds. Those bird watchers contributed 36 billion dollars to the nation's economy in 2006. There's a crash, there's a wow. Oh, I see. Yes, and look at his color. Isn't that beautiful? We caught up with some of them on Sapelo Island. A lot of the money that's spent on bird watching is spent on travel. Uh, you know, I've been to southeast Arizona more times than I can remember um, just to see birds. Uh, been all over the country, been to Africa, uh, Europe, uh, South America, it's, uh, it's a great, great way to see a lot of the world. Birders are attracted to Georgia's Colonial Coast Birding Trail. It cuts across wetlands and marshes, wildlife refuges and state parks. They have opportunities to view birds like the black-crowned night heron, which is hard to see since it feeds at night. When they spot a special bird, they check it off their list, like someone adding a piece of art to a prized collection. 
Always remember to keep an eye back here for falcons and accipiters running along that, that tree line. That's, that, they like to migrate right along that because there's a standing wave of wind going over that tree line. And because the state of Georgia has protected its barrier islands and set up management areas like the Butler Wildlife Refuge, there are lots of birds to see, including one on the endangered species list. Wood storks are, uh, are a really good story. They have come in Georgia from 1965 for the first, uh, first time they nested here coming out of Florida. And now we have close to 2,000 pairs that are nesting here. So they've been a real success story and they are definitely a wetland bird that uh, is a, a nice reflection of the, of the work the state, the federal government and the citizens of the state uh, uh, have combined to, to assist. Imagine losing this face. It was close. Wood storks were placed on the endangered species list after their numbers plunged, especially in Florida. This came at a time when hundreds of thousands of wetlands were being drained. Wood storks are amazing birds. That scaly face, the way they seem to care for their mates and their young. A pair of wood storks needs about 440 pounds of fish during breeding season to feed their chicks and themselves. That huge wingspan allows them to catch a current and glide for miles. But these birds need more than freshwater wetlands. We're really in kind of the crown jewel of the Georgia coast, and this is salt marsh and uh, we have about 400,000 acres of it in Georgia. We've got more salt marsh than any other state. Wading birds also use this saltwater marsh. Once they raise their chicks, they often forage out here during low tide. These marshes not only feed wading birds, they feed us. It's the breadbasket because it, it uh, is very rich uh, and produces uh, a lot of the fish that we eat. A lot of the fish that we pursue uh, for sports. So they start here? They start here. Uh, many of them start here. Other ones, the, the young fish uh, seek shelter in the grasses. Uh, shrimp, anybody that eats shrimp, this, is, uh, this produces the shrimp of the coast. And the shorebirds come through in the spring to eat the small crabs as they make their way north. Ha, I got, got them. Yeah, They're so you, fast. You can imagine the tide coming in and then fish coming into the shallows here to feed on these guys while the tide is up. The point Wynn makes is that everything is connected. An old message, but one that bears repeating. Uh, this is Spartina grass that we're looking out on. And as the stems die and the tide comes in and washes them in in a big mass like this, this is a, a, a good a nutrient for the marsh. And it's broken down gradually, so it's uh, the marsh almost feeding itself and the crabs uh, and other um, uh, mostly uh, bacteria and fungus eat away at this and break it down. And this is a, uh, a good nutrient, a big nutrient for the, for the marsh. So it's all working together. Aristotle wrote, in all things of nature, there is something of the marvelous from the places they live to the feathers on their backs, wading birds, in all their glory, are marvelous indeed. Everyone in this show is a hero in his or her own way. Thanks to their efforts, your children and your grandchildren will have a chance to see these birds. I'm Sharon Collins. We'll see you next time.
For more information about Waiting Birds or this show, check out our website at gpb.org slash Georgia Outdoors.